Hi everyone, we're going to start with a game where we're going to learn to classify objects that are ISA and non-ISA. In order to do this, we're going to train ourselves to make this classification using some examples. So here's an example. This is an ISA and this is not an ISA. This is not an ISA and this is not an ISA. However, this is an ISA, and this also is an ISA. So what we've done, or what we're doing, is we're training ourselves to learn what is and is that in order to do this classification. And we're doing this by creating an abstraction or a model, right? We're trying to abstract away some features that'll help us categorize objects as ISA and non-ISA. And we do this by using data. So we have this data set of objects. And not only do we have just data, but we have label data, meaning that we have the object, the square there on the left, and we have its label that it's an ISA. So we need that label data in order to do this training. So in order to learn what is an ISA and what is not an ISA. And once we do that, once we complete that phase of training that we've learned how to do this, now we can use that training in order to do inference. That's sort of the second phase of this, where we can make predictions as to the label or class of an object. So we can make a decision, is that first one that we see there an ISA or not an ISA? And I think you'd say, well, that's not an ISA. The second object, we haven't seen that shape before, but I'm hoping you'll think, yeah, that's an ISA. It's likely to be an ISA. The third object, that green circle, I'm pretty sure everyone will say that's not an ISA. The fourth one's a bit trickier because it has that dotted border, but if you guessed ISA, you'd be correct. And the last two are not ISA. So what we've done is called a classification task. And the first part of a classification task is training using labeled data. So we have that labeled data set and we're learning to make, well, what is an ISA? We just have some set of examples and we're making that abstraction or building a model. And once we do that, we can use inference to classify new instances. So we can see new objects and make these labels. And when we have a machine learning task that uses labeled data, that's called supervised learning. So supervised learning simply means a machine learning task that uses labeled data. And machine learning without un or with unlabeled data is called unsupervised learning. And we'll see an example of that later on in this course. Here's kind of a diagram, or this is a diagram of what we've done. So we started off being untrained, or we have this untrained model and we have a labeled training data set, and that's the training process where we're untrained and we take this labeled training data and through some process, we've created a trained model in our brain of you know what's this model, what's this abstraction. Once we have this model, we can then use inference, the part from the trained model onto predictions in this little chart. And for that, once we have the trained model, we can take unlabeled data and through an inference process, make predictions. So for now, for our first adventure into machine learning, we're going to ignore the training part and just focus on once we have a trained model, how can we use it to make predictions? And doing this, this is called using a pre-trained model. Someone else has trained the model for us. And the model we're going to be using is called LXNet. This is no longer a state-of-the-art model. It was developed about 10 years ago during the time that 10 years ago, it took six days to train the model. So you can see that using a pre-trained model is well worth it. It would save us a bunch of time. Even today with modern hardware, it would take us a while to train this LXNet model. And what LXNet does is it recognizes images and it classifies them into one of, of 1,000 different categories. Here are those categories. And it, the print is small, so let me just highlight a few of them. It can, when it sees a picture of a standard poodle, it knows standard poodle, box turtle, German shepherd, grasshopper, brown bear, bathtub, the list goes on and on. The face powder, espresso maker, and envelope. So let's actually start coding. We're going to go to Colab Research, google.com, and get started. Okay, so let's go to that site, colab.research.google.com. 
And here your results will look a little bit different than mine. I have a number of files I've created to do different things. I'm just going to cancel this. Yours will probably look like this. This is called a Jupyter Notebook. So this particular version is running on Google Colab, but you can have it running on your local machine. Now, Jupyter Notebooks are web-based interactive computing platforms. I guess that's the way to describe it. So using your browser, you can execute Python code. There's code cells that are Python code. You can have text information explaining what you're doing. You can have visualizations, graphs, and things along those lines, and equations. That probably covers the bulk of it. What Google Colab is, it's a hosted Jupyter Notebook service. And unless you have a desktop with a pretty decent GPU, a graphics card, running machine learning models on Google Colab will be a lot faster than running them on your laptop or desktop. So while you could do a lot of this work on your laptop, disconnected from the web, it'll end up being faster, especially the deep learning aspects if you're running it on Google Colab, as we'll see. So as I mentioned, there are text cells and executable cells. So let's look at an executable cell. That's this. It executes Python code. And let me just uh, execute it. To execute this cell, you do Shift Enter. And you get that result. And let's execute another one. The second in a week example, Shift Enter. So Shift Enter will execute the cell you're on. This is a text cell. You can open the text cell by double clicking. And then you can see what the editing looks like. You can change the edit whatever. Some, let's say you wanted, just wanted to annotate something you were doing in the next cell. The next cell is Python to do blah, 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 blah. And to close that and get to the formatted view, it's Shift Enter. So you just have to remember one thing. So you can see that our changes there. All right, and it pays to look at this page. This is the Welcome to Colab page that you'll see from Google because it gives you kind of the basic introduction to Google Colab and Jupyter Notebooks. And again, if you're working in Jupyter Notebooks, you can do it anywhere. So if you learn Google or Jupyter Notebooks here, you can transfer that skill to other places. Let's go ahead and open the actual notebook we'll be using. And I'm going to go on File, Open Notebook here. And we're going to choose GitHub. And it's pre-populated with my name because that's where I usually go. <laughs> but we're going to go Zaharsky ML class and hit that search magnifying glass. And we're going to use this labs quick start. So I'm going to open that. And let's just make this bigger. Let's see how big I can get it to be obnoxiously big. There, that's pretty big. All right, so what we have initially here is a text cell. Let me find my cursor. And to open that text cell to see to get the editing view, I just double click it. And as you can see, it looks similar to what I showed you before. Let me just close that again with Shift Enter. And the thing about um, Google Colab is that it automatically saves what you're doing in a Jupyter Notebook. So as you progress along, you don't need to hit save. It just automatically saves. Now there is one exception to that, and that is if you open a Google Notebook that's in GitHub, it will not save anything that you do. And I've had, <laughs> unfortunately, bad experiences in the past when I forget that one exception. So the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to have to go to File, and we're going to make our own copy of this one we got from GitHub. So I'm going to save a copy to Drive. And that gives us a brand new copy. I'm going to close the previous one just so I don't make a mistake of editing the wrong one. And I'm going to change the name to something that's recognizable. So let's say this is Sarah's copy. I'll just are working on this. And I'll so let's say this is Sarah working on this. And so I'll just go Sarah and go with that. So now it'll be saved to Sarah's drive or if on Sarah. <laughs> and uh, every chain change I make will automatically be saved. Okay, so this is all the text information. This is good to read. It's kind of what I covered in the intro to this, but just another slant, just another view of it. So it helps to read it again, just so you get some familiarity. And this is more a little more detailed than what I explained in the intro. 
So what I mentioned is Google Colab is a hosted Jupyter Notebook service. And it's a basically a virtual machine that you're provided for the short time you're using the Colab, that session. And that virtual machine doesn't have every single library we're going to be using. So we're going to have to install a library. And that virtual machine is basically a lin small Linux or Unix machine. These code cells execute Python code, as I mentioned. The one exception, or I guess there's multiple exceptions, one exception is that if you preface a command with a bang or an exclamation point like this one, it interprets the rest of that line as a Linux command. So let me just comment that out and oops, comment that out and add a command like I can do a simple list, show me what's in this directory. And it's this directory called sample data. Let's look what's in there. And it shows you all the files I have. You're not going to have these files. This is my Google Colab session. And you can get another view if you want to look at actually what's in the directory. There's this icon here of a folder. If you click there, you'll see what's in the root area. And if you hit sample data, you'll get the same results. So any arbitrary Linux command you can execute. That's So let's get rid of that line, get rid of that comment, and install this PyTorch Lightning library we'll be using. OK, we have that. Let me scroll up. So now we're going to import the computer vision library. That's the library that contains these models, these pre-trained models that we'll need. So from Torch Vision, we're going to import the models. I'm hitting shift enter to execute the code and let's just take a look at all the models available to us by going dir models and you can see there's a wide number of them all of these have to do with images whether it's image classification or segmentation which we'll learn a little bit later these are all models pre-trained models that relate to that but we're going to use the lxnet one so let me load that one and that's done so now that we have a pre-trained model, we can use it to perform inference. We can give it an image, and it'll tell us what it, that image is of, what category it is it. For that, we're going to start with this picture, a picture of my poodle ghost. And let's get that file locally. So here we have a command. Let me scroll up. So this, as I said, is it's preceded with this bang. So it's a Linux command. It's a curl. So we're going to get that file and locally call it poodle.jpg. Okay, that was quick. And now let's just load that into the image library, the Python image library, so we get that. And this is going to take some time, but let's display that image. There that huge image is looks good that's what we have in python and as this text says that image is 4032 by 3024 so 12 million pixels that's why it kind of took a while um and lxnet the model we are using was designed to work with images of 224 by 224 so we need to change this re or modify that image from 4000 by 3000 to this 224 by 224. So we're going to transform that. And for that, there's a library for that, fortunately. So in this course, we'll see that there's not that much code. It's just knowing what the pre-existing code is and how to use it. So we're going to use this transforms library because we are going to make some transformations of the size to get it down. And as I say in the text here, the first thing we're going to do is just make the image smaller to get it to 341 by 256 using this resize command. So that makes the image a bit smaller. And to get it down to its final 224 by 224 size, we're going to crop the image. So see, there's a lot of background just on both sides of this image. And we're just going to crop it to get a, a square 224 by 224 to get it to look like that. After we do that, we're going to convert this image. So again, this is an image um, that's originally was in JPEG, and we want it to be a tensor, so like an array or matrix, we can think of it as. And so we're going to convert it to a tensor. And so here is where I've combined all those. 
as uh, I've created this object called transform that resizes the image. It crops that image to be 224 by 224. It changes it to a tensor. And then we perform this normalization step. This normalization step we'll learn about much later. We don't need to worry too much about it. If you're interested, I give a bit of information in the text. So let me actually execute that code. Again, that execution is shift enter. And there I have that. And now I can trans, here's where I transform that image. Okay, so now we have the image in the shape we need to perform inference. And we've loaded the model. Now we just have to send that image to the model so it can classify what, what is that an image of. And remember that in a model, there are two phases or modes that the model can be in. There can be in a training mode or in an inference mode or what we call an eval mode. And this is alexnet.eval is putting it in that evaluation mode. So let's go ahead and do that. And it gives us more information than we probably want about the structure of that network. Now, much later in the course, we'll be able to understand every single little bit of this description of the network. For now, we're going to just say it's a black box that, raise, that recognizes images. OK, and now we're going to feed in that image into AlexNet and see what results we get. So the output of this is it's uh, one image that we fed it in, and there are 1,000 different values for that image. Now, there are 1,000 values for that image because there are 1,000 different categories that image could be. It could be a standard poodle. It could be an owl. It could be a violin. It could be a piano. So it could be 1,000 different things. And it's giving us a probability or a number related to how likely that image is of those thousand categories. And we can convert, let me just look at that output in its raw form. And though there are the numbers associated with how this, the first one, let me get that number back up. <laughs> ah. This is the number associated with whatever that first category is. But we can convert that to something a little bit more meaningful to us, which is the probability and let me just scroll down here to get there. And we can convert it to probabilities by using this soft masks function. And now we get it into, it's still weird numbers, but we at least get it into the probability that of the, what the categories are. And as you can see, kind of that first line, it's pretty unlikely that the images of these first five categories, whatever they are, because those are amazingly small numbers. Let's actually get some labels, descript, textual description of these categories. Let me scroll down here. For that, I'm going to load this file that has the names of the categories in. And then I'm going to load those what and display what those first five categories are. And they're all different types of fish. So it's good to know that our model, our pre-trained model, doesn't think that standard poodle picture is of any of these, is, isn't a shark. So what we want to know is, well, what does it think it is? So here what I'm doing is saying, what's the highest probability one you find in that 1,000 categories? And that's in position 267. And now we can print out the label associated with 267, which is I do here. And that's... Uh, it thinks the highest, most probable thing that picture is of a standard poodle, it's 38% sure of that. So that, I've kind of glossed over a bunch of things, but you can get the basic idea of what it's doing, right? And let's look at the first five positions that it could be. So what's the next thing? If it isn't a standard poodle, what could it have been? So here we see it was 38% thinking that it was a standard poodle, 37 a miniature poodle, maybe a toy poodle, a Maltese dog, a Cocker Spaniel. So all these top five ones were at least dogs, so at least it recognized that it was a dog. So here I'm turning this all what we've done. There's nothing new here. I'm just turning this into a, what we've done into a function so we can use it for other images. Let me execute that. 
and this is just giving us what the labels are so we can go when we go find pictures we can make sure it's one of the thousand that we see here are all the possibilities of what things could be and let's try one of those things so here I'm just saying predict I found a picture on Wikipedia here of an electric guitar let's take a look at that and let's go there okay that looks like an electric guitar to us what does it think what does our model think it is okay it's 99 percent sure it's an electric guitar so <laughs> at least the model works pretty well for electric guitars here's another one this is of an owl it's a nice let me get that image to show you Okay, that's an owl. And let's see if it thinks owl. So it's 72% sure it's a great uh, great gray owl. It's not a great gray owl, but it is an owl. I think it's a burrowing owl, but burrowing owl isn't included in the thousand categories, so that was pretty good. And here's an image of a cello. And let's try that. And it's 75% sure it's a cello, 25% sure, or 24% possible violin, and so on. So here it's your opportunity to try. So you can you follow it along and hit shift enter a bunch of times to show you my examples. And you should have enough information to try it on your own images. Try it on three different images, load in a different model and try it in that model, and answer some basic questions about what's going on. So that's it for this notebook. I didn't cover all the gory details. This was just a quick start to get you doing something that's a little bit fun, recognizing images and learning a little bit about how things work. And we'll see you in the next video. Bye.